Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Marhaba. Um, thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Nadim Khoury. I'm the executive director of the Arab Reform Initiative. Um, I just wanted to welcome you. Uh, I know everyone has Zoom fatigue, but hopefully to a uh, e-conference day, our inaugural uh, environmental politics conference, um, which uh, we'll be organizing over the next two days for very interesting panels. Um, and which we hope will become uh, a yearly event. Uh, and hopefully by next year, next summer, we'll be able to convene uh, physically. Uh, the idea uh, behind the conference and frankly behind our recently launched program on environmental politics is to really convene activists and researchers and policymakers uh, in the region to discuss uh, environmental questions as they intersect what we consider four critical political phenomena that go beyond simply environmental issues. Uh, and that are uh, issues of governance, um, but also issues of activism or popular mobilization, issues of local politics and local governance, uh, and finally, uh, environment and uh, armed conflict. Um, so as you can see, the, these issues, uh, the approach is, uh, political to the environment in the sense that these are political choices, these are governance choices. Uh, we are talking about uh, things like environmental justice, redistribution. This is not about you know, how to find technical solutions to environmental problems, but how can we intersect uh, issues of the environment with uh, political systems, with broader demands for social justice um, in our region. Um, and uh, to do that, so uh, this uh, inaugural conference will have uh, four panels. The first one today that uh, my colleague Farah will introduce to you, which is folk will focus much more on um, sort of the, the policy from above. Uh, but uh, this later on today, we'll have one looking at activism and resistance uh, and mobilizing for the environment and how in a way the environment has emerged as, as in many countries as the new frontier of forms of contestation. And tomorrow, and I hope you will join us uh, for all four panels, we'll be looking in a, as a counterpoint uh, environmentalism from below, uh, looking at the local politics, the global challenges, and the space of environmentalism when it comes to local governance issues. And we will conclude uh, looking at environment in countries of war, ecologies of war, and of course, um, occupation. Um, so I um, just wanted to tell everyone uh, that we will be having a written output from these conversations that we will be sharing with you. And I hope that you will stay with us uh, for the four panels. And I just wanted to conclude by really thanking uh, my colleagues and particularly uh, uh, Julia, our non-resident fellow, um, Julia Schreer, who really uh, helped us get to this point and conceptualize and think through this environmental conference and to say, hope to see you next year, all of us uh, in person. Thank you very much. Farah, over to you. Thank you, Nadim. Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. My name is Farah Al-Shami and I'm a research fellow at the Arab Reform Initiative. So thank you again for finding the time to join us today in the first webinar session of ARIES inaugural conference on environmental politics in the MENA region. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. First, we are providing simultaneous translation in both Arabic and English. So if, if you prefer Arabic, please click on the interpretation icon that is at the very bottom and go to the Arabic channel. If you prefer English, choose the English channel. And if you speak both languages and don't need interpretation, it would be better not to go to any channel, but just to keep the interpretation feature off. The second note is that we are also going live on social media. Uh, we can receive your questions and comments either here on Zoom through the Q&A box or in the comments section on social media, and we will make sure to transmit them uh, to the speakers. So um, this session is titled Governing the Environment, Discourse and Policy from Above. So indeed, uh, population growth, uncontrolled and unplanned urbanization, the shrinking role of the state and its retreat from public sectors and public service provisions have all led to the expansion of environmental problems as people demand access to, natur to natural resources, and the right to environmental services. The expansion of urban frontiers has also exacerbated conflicts around industrial facilities, garbage dumps, and incinerators. 
Moreover, the privatization of land and the politicization of water supply management, which is increasingly used by Arab regimes as a clientelistic instrument, have also fed the resistance to the dynamics of dispossession in rural areas. So as a result, what we see is extra extractive industries like in the mining regions of Gafsa in Tunisia and Karkenna in Morocco. We see issues of garbage mismanagement and dam building projects in countries like Lebanon, as well as issues of access to land property like in Jemna, Tunisia, or issues of air pollution and distorted irrigation systems like in Cairo, Egypt. Um, well, different communities are affected differently by environmental hazards. The impact on the global south is different than that on the global north. And the impact on urban areas is uh, very different from that on rural populations. And this flags the concept of the environmentalism of the poor or the environmentalism of the vulnerable. Contentious politics are also triggering waves and diverse forms of environmental activism all over the region. And we realize that state responses to environmentalism vary from imposing direct sections on related civic activities to surveillance mechanisms, smearing campaigns and media attacks and rising populism. Arab states justify their repressive measures by putting, putting national security, territorial integrity, and national identity before environmental sustainability. More broadly, it is neoliberalism that is governing the environment in the region. For example, the adoption of the IMF and World Bank structural adjustment policies and the trade liberalization that they entail have highly integrated Tunisia in the competitive world food markets in the name of the salt food security instead of food self-sufficiency approach. This promoted a dependency on stable food imports and promoted low productivity economic sectors. Therefore, our session today uh, now revolves ar around the truth and distortions of current state-led discourses about the environment at the Middle East and the way these state discourses shape environmental policies. It also taps into the state-led environmental projects that significantly reveal the political economy traits of the Arab regimes, as the environmental lens can tell us a lot about governance in the region. The session will also examine the biggest gaps in our collective knowledge on institutional and political landscape that governs national level decisions on the environment in the region and will suggest ways to close these gaps. We have with us today four experts who will tell us more about all of these dynamics in the region. Each speaker will have a maximum of 12 minutes to speak, and then we will open the floor for a 20 to 30 minute uh, Q&A. So let's now get started with Jessica Barnes, who is a scholar of resource use and environmental change in the Middle East. Uh, Jessica will reflect on what we mean when we talk about the environment and how we think about governance. She will draw on her experience conducting ethnographic research on water, climate change, and food security in the Middle East to reflect on these two questions. Over to you, Jessica, you have 12 minutes. Thank you, Farah. Well, firstly, just um, a huge thanks for the invitation to be part of this initiative. I'm really thrilled to be here and amongst such a wonderful group of people who are working on um, environmental issues in the Middle East and very much looking forward to our discussion today. So my comments for the panel, I wanted to reflect on two of the words in our panel title, governing and environment. Um, but first, a few words about the perspective from which I, from which I approach these, this topic. So I'm an environmental anthropologist. I've conducted ethnographic research in the Middle East um, since 2004, first in Syria, um, then for a more extended period of time in Egypt. My first book, Cultivating the Nile, was about water politics. Um, I then did some work on climate change issues um, before tying to the research for my forthcoming book, Staple Security, which is about bread, wheat, and food security in Egypt. So the first question I want to raise for the panel is what do we mean by the environment? One of the things I've noticed over my years working in the Middle East is that the Arabic word for the environment, albiya, doesn't hold a wide resonance. When I first started to do research in the region as a master's student, the name of my degree program, which was environmental management, Idaratulbiya, invariably met with baffled looks. I would try to reframe my degree in terms that might be more readily understood. It's a bit like agricultural engineering, I would say. But I'm not an engineer. And I also wonder what is lost when we perceive the environmental domain only through the lens of technical disciplines like engineering. 
To me, the word environment is an expansive one. I think of the environment as the space in which we build our lives and livelihoods, an interconnected web of land, air, water, plants, and animals that both shapes and is shaped by um, social relations. So in my opinion, tapping soil nutrients and diverting water to grow a crop is an environmental issue. Channeling water through a city so that people can drink and to carry away their waste is an environmental issue. Moving large quantities of grain around the world and across the oceans to provide a staple food is an environmental issue. Yet this isn't how most governments of the Arab world think about the environment. More commonly, the environment is conceptualized in narrow terms, encompassing things like waste management, nature conservation, and pollution control. Nice extras to be considered when other development priorities are dealt with, rather than a central component of human livelihoods and well being. Ruling regimes may understand that water pollution is an issue, but they're much more concerned with water scarcity. They may acknowledge the significance of biodiversity, but consider other funding needs much more pressing. Back in the 1990s, a number of countries in the region created ministries of the environment to take on responsibility for the, this realm of governance. Now, on the one hand, this was a recognition of the environment as an important thing to think about. Um, but on the other hand, this bureaucratic organization has two effects. First, assigning responsibility to a specific ministry hampers an integrated approach to thinking about environmental issues. How do you plan for adaptation to climate change in Egypt, for example, which may exacerbate water scarcity, when responsibility, responsibility for climate change falls to one ministry, water to another, and agriculture, which is the main user of water, to a third? Second, it means that progress on environmental goals rests with a governmental agency that is often, from what, my, what I've seen, marginalized. This is certainly my sense of the case in Egypt. And if the ministry lacks power, its ability to make change to govern is constrained. This brings me to my second question of what exactly we mean by governing. Who gets to govern and who is governed? One of the things I'm interested in doing in my own research is in thinking across scales. So my research examines policy frameworks and national programs, but I'm also interested in the degree to which those national decisions result in actions and changes at the local level. Ultimately, what I care about is people's everyday lived experience and how their quality of life is shaped by their access to and interaction with various facets of the environment. So I think it's important to note the potential for a mismatch between the policy making taking place in the head offices of national ministries located in capital cities and what is going on in the regional and local bureaucratic offices that are tasked with implementing those policies. While the theme of this, pa of this panel is discourse and policy from above, I don't think we can think of policy or governance as only being from above. And by this, I don't just mean pointing to local forms of activism and mobilization around environmental issues, which I know the conference is going to examine in subsequent panels. Rather, I mean that we have to trace how governmental policies um, sort of play out from their conceptualization to their implementation and how potentially they morph in the process, often in ways that might not be necessarily anticipated. When I was doing my research on irrigation in Egypt, this was actually a big theme in my observations. Um, high level officials in Cairo would say one thing, but what I saw in the irrigation directorate in Fayoum City, which was where I was doing my field work, um, was very different. And what I saw in the offices of local district engineers in rural villages of Fayoum province was very different again. To give a second example, at the state level, you often have these large scale state led environmental projects that reveal the continuing allure of the mega project. And I think this in itself might be something interesting for us to talk about as a panel. Take, for example, the very widely discussed and debated and um, ambitious re land reclamation projects in Egypt, like the Toshka scheme or CC's most recent 1.5 million for Dan project. Such projects do political work. They broadcast a sense of power and mastery over nature. They reflect the entrenched interests and in capital intensive high profile interventions. Yet I suspect that were you to probe the perspectives of officials within the Ministry of Agriculture, both in Cairo and in the governorates where these reclamation programs are being implemented and seeking to turn these large swathes of desert into agricultural land, you would find a much more varied perspective. 
agricultural specialists who recognize the challenges of making sandy soils fertile, for example, or water specialists who question the sustainability of further tapping into limited resources. So we have to disaggregate the state, um, as many anthropologists have argued, moving beyond a monolithic portrayal to think about how state power is variously enacted um, across different sites and with varied environmental consequences. One of the questions the organizers posed to us panelists was about where we see gaps in our knowledge of the institutional and political landscape that governs national level decisions on the environment. I would say that one of the biggest gaps in our knowledge isn't about national level decisions so much as the political negotiations and cultural mediations through which those decisions translate or fail to translate into concrete actions on the ground. To close this gap, we need more than engineers. Furthermore, I also think we need to expand our scale of thinking in the other direction. One of the things that was really striking to me when I was working on water issues in Egypt was the role of international and bilateral donors, um, namely the World Bank, USA, the Dutch and the Germans. These donors fund various environmental programs and as a result help shape the government's agenda and approach to environmental governance. One development practitioner who was leading a project in the Ministry of Water once joked to me that she thought the ministry was suffering from project titus. By this, she meant that the ministry had become so focused on capitalizing on funding opportunities that its entire mode of operation was now project based. There was very little sense of a kind of an ongoing consistent sort of day to day operation oriented around a national water plan or strategy, which incidentally, uh, the national water plan was also written by international consultants working for a donor funded project. So I don't think we can understand national level decisions on the environment in the region without appreciating the role and the interests of international donors. To conclude, I'd argue that these two points on the need to first reflect carefully on how we and other actors are deploying the term environment, and secondly, to pause to define the varied sites in which governance takes place, are important ones for understanding more about how the countries of the region are dealing with some of the pressing, pressing challenges of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. Um, it's a very interesting uh, intervention that you've just made. So I will now pass the floor to our dear Wael Gamal, who is an Egyptian economic journalist and researcher, and who will be engaging with all the previous mentioned, uh, previously mentioned questions. Uh, Wael will also more particularly emphasize social and ecological inequalities and fiscal policy considerations from the lens of climate change and social justice. Wael, uh, the floor is yours now, you have 12 minutes. شكرا جزيلا يا فرح وشكرا للمبادرة على الدعوة. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers. I will be focusing on aspects related to the political economy and the relationship with social justice, environmental justice, as well as risks related to climate change that uh, everyone around the globe faces. And let me get started from where Nadim left off. It is not a technical issue, that is rather a political issue. And it's very important to look at it from this perspective. First, because mostly it's not possible to deal with disparities related to the environment and the crisis around the climate uh, change, but through the power balances, strengths and weaknesses, which can explain certain institutional distortions that Jessica had spoken about in the Egyptian case. It is not a coincidence that roles are distributed this way because it's part of the structure of the economic and social perspective of the state in general, as well as interests that impose themselves on the public interest. It's not, it doesn't go down to um, competence or technical issues. Uh, a technical method to address uh, the issue because I believe that we are in a time where there is a complex uh, crisis, uh, deep economic uh, health and environmental crises 
that uh, would lead the world to uh, a disaster. There are recurrent calls by several conservative uh, entities the World Social Forum, the economic, the World Economic Forum, to reconsider the uh, paradigm of the economic policy, uh, calling for even a new social contract because of the complexities. It, it is not possible to make a distinction between social justice and environmental justice, to tell you the truth, and that's at several uh, levels. First, the poor and the most uh, vulnerable groups in the different uh, societies got uh, more affected by environmentally related issues and lack of uh, resource distribution. They uh, pay a bigger burden while uh, their responsibility is much lower because uh, uh, the income of such vulnerable groups uh, do not allow them to uh, consume like the rich. So the lack of equality doesn't uh, lie between societies only about within societies. So uh, the discrepancies between uh, poor and rich countries affect uh, the liability making and the uh, responsibilization. If we want to think about a solution for the environmental issues, there is a very profound interlinkages between what used to be called in the past the poverty trap, the poverty trap and the environment uh, trap. There is an environment poverty trap that uh, we witness nowadays. And with the growing environmental discrepancies, uh, social and economic discrepancies go deeper. It is very essential for any policy that tries to deal with social discrepancies to take into consideration, vice versa, to take into consideration the um, other types of uh, discrepancies. And here there is an important point to consider dealing with the environmental equality uh, might uh, largely uh, affect the economic and social uh, equality, but the opposite is not uh, valid. In many cases, solutions to the creation of job opportunities, increasing manufacturing or improving development situations might have adverse effects on the environment. So here we have a very uh, complex uh, options. We need to see how to come up with uh, a social contract that doesn't affect or doesn't exacerbate the social crisis. In the Arab world, we have a very bad situation in terms of both uh, sides, according to the latest uh, figures by uh, Thomas Piketty and uh, his group, the 10% highest income get 56% of the income, 1% of the highest income gets uh, double of what the 50% lowest uh, income people and with 12.5% of uh, the uh, Arabs of the least uh, income uh, uh, people. And the region is one of the most affected by the climate change and is uh, uh, threatened with very high levels of temperature by uh, 2050. We know that uh, there are possibilities of floodings, drought, um, sandstorms, and many other related risks and threats. So the environmental crisis is very deep uh, in this region, and it might be even deeper than uh, elsewhere in other regions. The issue is that the current economic uh, uh, neoliberal system, as mentioned by Farah, where the state plays a very uh, deep role, but not in the uh, social uh, state of the 60s, but where 
there is a deep and dominance by the financial and the economic groups on the wealth, wealth production, and the expansion of such a dominance and control of the public resources. That is not uh, only at the level of the manufacturing, uh, the oil and gas extractive industries, which are one of uh, the uh, most affected by lack of transparency, where the licensing and awarding rules uh, do not uh, respond to scientific uh, standards. And that's part of the uh, sharing, resource sharing by the uh, local uh, and international businessmen while well, the state play a role in directing the wealth of the majority to the uh, uh, really ruling minority. Most importantly, there is a focus on fossil fuel and the introduction of uh, polluting economies for competitive uh, considerations and export considerations. In addition, such a pattern makes the public policies when dealing with causes uh, that are uh, pushed forward by other countries or through, for example, protests like we've seen uh, lately in the North, uh, North Africa, where there are protests that bring together the social distribution and uh, the uh, justice uh, in the distribution, social justice, employment. So under pressure, the state starts dealing with this topic. However, uh, they apply the same public philosophy, the neoliberal philosophy. So resorting to market solutions with big investments in the solutions related to the capital intensive mechanisms, capital intensive mechanisms, for example, in projects related to renewable energy, solar energy in Morocco and in Egypt, we mainly have big companies with bidding by uh, multinationals or local enterprises uh, that are uh, Ad, established ad hoc with uh, big factories uh, that are capital intensive and no real social solutions that uh, ensure the sharing of benefits where the grassroots play a role in the decision making and take part in the uh, process like we see in uh, countries like Denmark where the uh, wind energy is a local issue that is related to citizens and it's not based on capital intensive mechanisms especially that in the last 30 uh, years, it was a big issue. In the last 30 years, uh, the solutions, uh, market-driven solutions for the environmental crisis were not successful in dealing with the environmental issue that uh, gets worse by the day. And at the same time, they do not give the chance to the public expenditure uh, to use its compass in both uh, aspects. I mean, the uh, social equality and uh, the environmental equality, and that is the only uh, condition. I might uh, give an example with regard to the Egyptian package of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. 100 billion Egyptian pound was uh, spent uh, in 2020, 2021, 16 percent of this package was only used by the health sector, seven out of uh, 10 uh, to the um, small and medium uh, private sector. And we see that uh, 21 percent uh, went to the uh, exporters, 13% to the industrial sector. So even when you see that there is a very uh, uh, complex uh, crisis, 72% uh, uh, of the Egyptians suffered from an income regression in the first six months of the COVID-19. But even with all of that, the financial policy is totally oriented towards uh, uh, um, the uh, big uh, capital, the private sector, while neglecting the uh, SMEs, which accounts for the largest part of the private sector in the Arab world. 
I believe that uh, the green uh, capitalization, the green expenditure so far was not able to address the crisis and it's very much uh, needed uh, to uh, try and seek a different economic system because we don't want a, a, we, what we mean is a structural change for the public uh, policy related to the economy and the climate change. One of the most important standards in this aspect is that this policy must be based on a grassroots uh, economic uh, democracy, a high sense of solidarity, as well as uh, a support to the uh, common interests versus profit-based uh, balance of power. It must be able to consider the contradictions between the development considerations and the democracy. It must be, uh, it must enjoy a very high level of transparency and governance. Thank you very much. Thank you for this intervention. The economic and social justice, as well as the economic considerations, are very important, especially from the uh, green uh, economy perspective. Uh, Hussam Hussein is a scholar of hydropolitics in Jordan. He will sure convince us that the way we understand water scarcity is important as it drives how we identify appropriate solutions to ensure water security. And to that end, uh, Hussam will focus on the case of Jordan. Hussam, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Farah, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak and uh, be part of this conversation in this uh, conference on environmental politics in the MENA region, which I, th I think it's uh, a very interesting topic, obviously. Also, it's nice to see that it is organized and uh, being launched by the Arab Reform Initiative, so really uh, from the region, uh, bringing uh, experts to reflect on this uh, very important topic. Uh, and the title also of this uh, panel, uh, which focuses on discourses and policies from above, to reflect on how to govern the environment. I think it's very nice that uh, we are bringing together discourses and policies to see the interlinkages of how discourses uh, and our understandings of problems shape <clears throat> policies. Um, discourses and knowledge construction, in fact, especially on environmental resources can be useful ways to understand environmental uh, issues in relation to political economy. So to try to unpack the political economy of uh, countries um, and therefore, uh, discourses and narrative, in fact, portray and define how we and people understand uh, uh, a problem. And therefore, according to how we understand a problem, then we will try to act accordingly to try to find uh, appropriate policies and uh, solutions to solve these, uh, these problems. And this is particularly important, I believe, for environmental issues because of the nature of the environment and environmental uh, problems, environmental problems, which are often complex uh, and require interdisciplinary uh, research and uh, collaborations in order to unpack and for, especially for the broader public. Uh, uh, I mean, it is obviously quite challenging for us, uh, uh, so, so called experts and academics to, to find appropriate solutions, but it is even more difficult for those that do not have uh, the technical expertise and therefore discourses uh, and narratives become even more important because they frame uh, the, the, the understanding of, uh, of the problem to the general public as well. And especially the so-called sanction discourses, which are the dominant discourses, the more mainstream discourses, which, which are the usually those from above, which we are looking at in this panel, are even more powerful because usually uh, they benefit uh, uh, from the uh, the visibility they have from mass media and the, the broader uh, communications uh, channels that uh, governments usually can use and deploy. And the form of what I'm going to be uh, talking about, as uh, Farah mentioned, is uh, uh, the case of Jordan, and particularly the issue of water scarcity, which was one like the main uh, uh, topic that I 
investigated during my PhD uh, that started back in 2012 until 2016-17. And there I decided to investigate exactly how water scarcity is constructed uh, from a discursive and narrative uh, perspective in Jordan, uh, looking both at the uh, more the mainstream and the governmental uh, portray of this uh, environmental challenge, but also at uh, alternative uh, uh, yeah, narratives and discourse, especially like from the bottom up, no? so the NGOs, uh, some academics, um, and uh, also the donors and international organizations, so different perspectives on this uh, important issue of water scarcity. And uh, what I found was that there's uh, the mainstream and more sanctioned and governmental uh, discourse about water scarcity, which uh, is also the one that we find in, uh, not only in the governmental reports, but also in textbooks, uh, also in newspapers, in the mass media, in official declarations of uh, politicians. And they emphasize the fact that we have water scarcity in Jordan because of uh, the limited water resources uh, we have, and uh, also due to the increased population and to factors external to the responsibility of the government. And the four, the four factors that I, uh, I mean, I say I, but like obviously I did on previous literature, no? so like, uh, but like what I found uh, during my uh, research was uh, that the, there was an emphasis on population growth uh, and uh, refugees and immigration. So like on the number of population that has uh, enormously increased in Jordan, uh, as well as I believe in other countries in the region, such as Lebanon or Turkey. So like an increase in the population, especially due to external migration coming to the country, following obviously, as we all know, uh, regional conflicts uh, uh, that pushed uh, uh, refugees to, to move to other uh, more stable countries. And, the, and that was a big reason. The other one was the so-called unfair sharing uh, of the transboundary water resources, uh, which Jordan felt to be quite unfair. Uh, obviously, I mean, it, I mean, it's quite controversial to, like, to define the fairness. You know, what is fair? I mean, that opens another big box. But like uh, uh, in the general narratives, there's this uh, feeling of unfair sharing of uh, water resources, both like, uh, especially when talking with the government uh, in relation to Syria on the Yarmouk uh, river resources. Um, another one is, and so both these reasons emphasize external factors, so external uh, neighboring countries or people coming from outside. And the other two reasons that this mainstream narrative emphasizes is the environment and the nature. So climate change as an additional pressure uh, which obviously uh, decreases precipitations and impacts water resources in different ways, uh, recharge of groundwaters and other ways. And the fourth reason is the aridity and low precipitation. So uh, Jordan as uh, a country mainly desertic uh, with uh, uh, low precipitation, so it's quite natural to have uh, low uh, precipitation and quite often arid uh, country with uh, issues of water scarcity. And uh, so these four reasons uh, emphasize that the blame is not really on the government and on the governance of the water resources, but it's more externalized towards either the environment or the neighboring countries. And the problem is that we have an increasing in uh, demand of water, uh, but at the same time, uh, the water resources that we have are limited and therefore are not enough to match the growing demand. So that's the portray of uh, the mainstream uh, discourse of water scarcity. However, we also have another uh, discourse which uh, is uh, more is not mainstream, and um, uh, as I was mentioning, it's been more developed by NGOs uh, uh, and uh, donors and international organizations, which put the emphasis. On, uh, uh, on the fact that water resources are uh, limited, it's true, but uh, that would be enough if they were well managed. So the issue is really on the mismanagement of the existing water resources, which would be enough if they were better managed. And um, looking more closely at these uh, reasons of uh, water mismanagement, uh, uh, the most mentioned ones are uh, non-revenue water uh, due to leakages uh, and physical losses, 
uh, non revenue water due to illegal wells and uh, uh, illegal uses and illegal connections to the main pipes. And the third one is the agricultural sector, which is seen to be quite unsustainable in terms uh, of type of crops um, and also of exports of uh, uh, certain types of crops to uh, countries in the GCC or in the neighboring, uh, neighboring countries, uh, uh, but also, to, I mean, depending on which uh, uh, part of Jordan we look at and which agriculture, also like the type of irrigation, which is uh, which uh, could be improved with uh, better technologies. So uh, we can see here that the emphasis is obviously on mismanagement and therefore water could be enough if better managed, uh, which links to some extent also to what was uh, mentioned earlier of the neoliberal uh, discourse, which I mean, we can see in a second also on the solutions. Um, but something also to, to, to mention that I wanted to mention is that um, um, yeah, I mean, one of the guiding questions was on the truth and distortions. I mean, here it's not really on truth and distortions in this case, but it's more on the emphasis that different actors put on the different reasons, because speaking with NGOs and donors, they would never say that no climate change does not exist, or it's not true that we have a population growth, but it's more on the emphasis that different donors put on the different causes within these narratives. Um, so that was, I think, quite uh, of an interesting uh, finding. And the solutions are really, and therefore the policies going back to the titles, are really in line with the, how different actors understand and build this, uh, uh, understand and portray and frame the environmental problem of water. So according to the first one, we have limited res water resources and therefore we need to increase the supply by building uh, a large environmental projects to solve the issue of water uh, in Jordan. And the two projects that uh, we might have heard of are uh, one, the DC Canal, which is uh, uh, basically a big canal that has been actually built and now it's operational since 2014, more or less, uh, pumping water from uh, the southern part of the country, the DC aquifer that is non-renewable aquifer uh, and is shared with Saudi Arabia, pumping it up to the northern part of the country, to Amman and uh, Erbed and the northern part, northern urban areas, um, 300 kilometers north, using a lot of energy uh, and using uh, no renewable uh, water resources. So it, it is quite problematic to some extent, but uh, it is seen as a, a very uh, uh, key strategic uh, uh, project to ensure water security in the country and for the stability, which links a bit to the securitization. Uh, yes. Uh, the other is the other big project is uh, the um, Red Dead Canal, uh, which also aims at increasing uh, uh, water by desalinizing. So those are the two main solutions in line with the first uh, with the first uh, uh, narrative. But looking at the solutions of the second narrative, I'm about to conclude. Uh, they uh, push for solutions on the water demand management and therefore challenging the current allocations of water resources, uh, especially towards the uh, illegal user and the agricultural user saying, we need to increase the water tariffing in agriculture. We need to uh, have regulations on the type of crops, et cetera, et cetera. However, we can obviously see that this, is, this kind of solutions are more challenging for the government because they're politically uh, more uh, challenging. Um, However, while the first set of solutions on the supply are economically challenging and usually donors uh, are involved and in, in supporting the government uh, financially. And that's why from a governmental perspective, and we can dig uh, during the question and answers later on on the political economy, but it's really interesting to see that uh, the discourses uh, of the, main, the mainstream discourses of the government from above uh, really drive to implement solutions, policy solutions to increase the supply and maintain the status quo, which is politically uh, more feasible for the government than challenging the current allocations, uh, the current interests of those that are benefiting and therefore more politically challenging uh, while less economically uh, interesting. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hossam. Uh, very informative uh, contribution and very important and interesting examples. Uh, so 
Over to you now, Roland Yashi. You are a scholar of political ecology of food and water in the MENA. You will tell us more, but please correct me if I'm wrong, about the nexus between uh, neoliberalism, food and ruling regimes, and food prices or food security, as well as water security in the Arab region. The floor is yours. Uh, you've got 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Farah. Uh, it's not an easy um, uh, like uh, topic to, uh, to cover the whole MENA region. Everyone has a country, but I will try to have some common denominators, actually, that can uh, that are actually getting out of my actual work working on um, the integration of uh, Arab food systems into global uh, historical food regimes. So uh, I'm an economist, but I wasn't um, maybe satisfied uh, with my econometric model in my PhD. This is what pushed me first to looking into the historical political economy of water in Lebanon. And then expanding on this, I figured out that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of commonalities between uh, Lebanon, even though it's a small countries and other countries like Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, closer Palestine, Syria, um, like all, all of the region of the Arab world. And this may be what is setting actually my new uh, research agenda. So um, um, something very common that we that, that like everyone uh, talked about and especially Hussam pointed on are the uh, dominant discourses that uh, shape uh, the policies in the Arab world. Um, they are actually um, yeah, like food and water have some also commonalities that they are often depicted by the mainstream commentators as a combination of uh, like scarce fertile lands, uh, scarce water, insecurity and wars, demographic growth. Uh, lack of technological uh, knowledge, uh, value chain mismanagement, or bad governance. So, so though if we look into epistemologically those, we figured out that well, it's a, it's a Malthusian uh, way of thinking, uh, taking uh, the volume of water and dividing it by the number of population, ending up with a uh, Falcon Mark Index setting countries. Well, if you're a thousand cubic square meter less uh, water per capita per year, so you are. Uh, in a water scale. So it's a very Malthusian way of thinking. And I think we should go to, uh, beyond those uh, paradigms. Um, one is they are Malthusian. Uh, second, they are very Ricardian because like uh, Ricardo might say, we, we don't have the comparative advantages uh, to grow our food, neither to, uh, you know, because we are doomed, we don't have natural resources. And the third one, I may say, it's a social Darwinist basis of Orientalist perspective of a dry, um, uh, uh, like uh, Arab world, you know, uh, which links, if you want, that we have despotic rulers and uh, lack of technology. So we, we do uh, we do not fit. So, but the problem are not here. And one of the like the counter argument today uh, is that if we don't have enough water and fertile lands, why would Hussam, uh, for example, in Jordan, figure out that uh, Jordan, for example, produces seven folds its needs in tomatoes? Uh, so we are true. We are food uh, import dependent on um, uh, like rain-fed staple cereals, but at the same time we grow water-intensive crops. Let well, I will tell you about uh, uh, avocado or uh, manga from Egypt, and maybe uh, like uh, uh, feeding and you know the deserts of all. Uh, uh, the deserts of the Sahara. Yani of many Arab countries and European countries. So it's not a matter of lack of water, and, but it's a matter of uh, like unjust um, uh, water appropriation and uh, dispossession as Farah was telling us at the beginning of the session. So um, like, and, and again, what Jessica was uh, just saying that the donors must be uh, in the picture again, and this, this is historical. This is historical because actually, well, the hegemony over the Arab world was uh, set uh, at a large extent by imperial powers that are the same, that divided those countries, that set for the first time regulatory, and for the first time it was the um, introduction of property, um, whether in Egypt or in maybe earlier in Algeria, the first country in 1830, uh, distributing uh, land properties to uh, colons, European colons. This, uh, also, yeah, it ended up also the same in uh, the case of Palestine, uh, where uh, Zionists actually, uh, the, the, the common, and in Palestine, 70% of lands in 1930 were still Musha lands, 
were collective without title deeds. So this has facilitated until the new colonization. So, and the most recent one, but this is something we share, the property matter, something another we share, and it is also from colonial roots. I think it's technology. So one is also, uh, I mean, uh, they had their, also their share Zionist of being depicted by French and British mandate as being the, the model to follow. Uh, they, we have to, uh, to bloom the desert, all of us. This is a sign of uh, moder modernity and civilization. And so uh, and we ended up having those large scale infrastructures. Uh, Aswan Dam is not Nasser's uh, uh, plan, but it was actually a British one. So, uh, and until today, it's not a, it's not a matter that we are uh, really grasping uh, what would happen to Egypt if the Nahda Dam again, another large scale project will happen. And uh, well, I will tell you about the anxiety now of um, Egyptian people about this topic. So it's a, it's a matter of people, but people are not consulted. This is this is uh, and neither the farmers of Ethiopia, neither the farms of Sudan, neither the no. It's a matter of policy from above, as the uh, talk is saying. So one is property. This is one very important dimension. Like Wael was uh, referring to uh, income redistribution and Piketty, but I can tell you the same refers to land uh, inequality in the Arab world. You can say 1% own 25% of the, the agricultural lands in many, agri in many uh, agrarian countries or that, has, that have agricultural lands in the Arab world. So, and 50% will own, uh, this is the case at least in Egypt and Tunisia and uh, the Lebanon that I know better, but I can tell you that it can be translated to other, Syria also. So, a lot of countries do have this uh, unequal access to land, and this has its uh, roots back to the colonial and imperial power. Second dimension is technology. And third dimension is, of course, the market dependence that I was talking about, whether from silk uh, and cotton in Egypt, where sub self-subsistence uh, crops were uh, actually um, uh, like uh, diverted, lands were diverted toward uh, growing uh, cotton and uh, uh, silk and collapsed later at the beginning of the 20th century, we are witnessing the same market dependency today. We import staple rain-fed crops that we can grow um, with our abundant lands, with, uh, with, the, with the means that we have. And at the same time, an untold story about export dependent dependency of the Arab world. Uh, which requires high water intensive um, mobilization. So, uh, so those are the, the I think three main um, like uh, commonalities of uh, the Arab world. Uh, like back getting back to you know, to the recent uprising uh, in the Arab world that Wael was talking about. I think you know, the Bouaziz is something we forget also uh, to to, you know, to look into it as a he's at the bottom of a. Um, yeah, unequal uh, food system. He was uh, the vendor on a of a, a fruit and vegetable, uh, you know, uh, cart, but it, that was confiscated. But behind him, who grew who grew those tomatoes and salads, and you know, uh, under what circumstances in semi-arid areas? Um, well, you check out, you saw, you would may found most probably large landowners behind, um, uh, like. Uh, um, overusing uh, Tunisian groundwater. This is something that we uh, that we can can travel all around the Arab world, and this is actually one of the reasons of uh, main reasons, like ecological. Um, what's something I would maybe end on is that, well, ecological and social. Maybe maybe ecological dimension did not take a lot of. Um, uh, like uh, importance in the literature about injustice in the Arab world. And thank you, Arab Reform Initiative, for uh, getting this to the table. I think it's an inherent and like uh, rooted uh, concept. And it's a, and if, uh, if we can say um, something that it is very debated in Europe since a while, well, the agrarian um, uh, roots of uh, capitalism in, the, uh, in, the Euro in Europe, why would we ask the same debate and open it? And I'm pretty sure any one of you who would be looking in the history of any country in the region, looking into the two last centuries, he would start looking into agricultural means. 
and this may, uh, you know, uh, bifurcate at some point. The, the idea is to get it back to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roland, for uh, the, the very illuminating thoughts. And actually, I would like to thank you for pointing out on the Malthusian way of doing or of assessing things that is currently uh, prevailing because it's very critical, yet rare are talking about it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for this. We're thank gonna you. start now by uh, taking um, questions and I'm gonna start with Roland and end with Jessica actually. So let me start with you, Roland. You're not gonna get a break now. So uh, one question that we have is regarding the Nile Dam which is seen as the 20th, by some definitely, as the 20th uh, century solution for the 21st century problem, uh, and which reminds people of big projects to conquer na nature, which are no longer acceptable, just similar to China's policy in Africa. So I'm sure you have a lot to, to say about this. The floor is yours. I think well has much more to say about it, his living this, but I can say, I, I would may argue that uh, and Mursi's uh, willingness maybe to open the discussion with um, like the river, the, the, the Nile Basin initiative initiated by Ethiopia uh, ousted him. So, um, it, it is a very, very critical question and I, I, I leave it to well to ask, but now the questions are being asked and really in the newspapers are, the, the land, the, how many years would uh, last uh, to fill this Nahda Dam and how would this affect us Egyptian downstream? Um, and this dates back, as I was saying, to uh, well, um, uh, colonial hegemonic power that set those rules and maybe Egypt later in nation state building has um, like, uh, it was in a matter of national and sovereignty. And now this uh, history of powers is getting back um, like uh, it's, it's said, by, I prefer the well. I, I'm pretty sure that he has much, much, much more to say about it. But it's a matter of hegemony. It's a matter of um, again for Ethiopia. It's a matter of uh, intensive agriculture. It's a matter uh, um, uh, materially. It's a matter of uh, capital. Uh, I would argue that, and it has those uh, networks that are building and uh, like separating powers. You know, uh, in the region, so um, I yes, Kuroulan. Actually, I I kept this question for you because we have two questions addressed to Well, but Well, if you have anything to add, please feel free to come in. Um, uh, Yanni, it's uh, I may add that uh, it's 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 also is not a very technical issue. It's a political issue, um, and I agree totally that uh, that there is exclusion of of um, of. Uh, of people in Ethiopia and in Sudan and Egypt from the discussion. In Ethiopia, for example, we have a lot of research on the land grabbing uh, industry there by Gulf uh, investments that, that really uh, uh, take farmers out of their land and uh, uh, yeah, uh, impose um, uh, a capital intensive kind of agrarian uh, uh, industry there and of course they, the Ethiopians have a right to development but the issue here and there is disagreement on the on the technical consequences of the dam till now uh, we have papers say that it will destroy the um, yeah the, uh, the water uh, security of Sudan Egypt totally uh, and other research that says that uh, uh, with the kind of uh, flood we have in the Nile nowadays, it's not necessarily very dangerous, but it has to be um, negotiated and uh, uh, organized collectively between the, all the countries involved to make sure that in the future it will not, the burden will, will not be huge. But of course, this 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 is a sign of the kind of uh, dilemmas we have. Uh, and, and <laughs> while we have governments like uh, the kind we, uh, now, uh, we see now in Ethiopia, which uh, is populist and uses the, the dam as one of the a politi yeah, a political bargaining and issue internally more, more than externally. So the, uh, it, it is political.
Yes, uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, please stay with us because we've got another question for you, which is that, so starting from how the discovery of phosphate turned from being an opportunity for prosperity, especially in the peripheries, and to a reason for uh, behind harsh economic conditions and an unemployment crisis in Tunisia. And looking at, on GABES in Tunisia and on Alexandria and Egypt and air pollution uh, coming from chemical industries. What do you have to say about the business and human rights law that are uh, somehow uh, controlling this? Um, well, this is the kind of, uh, of paradigm that controls the economic policy in, in Tunisia and in Egypt. Um, uh, and Roland was referring to the, the export-led paradigm that it, it is important to focus on uh, products that you can uh, uh, export whatever the cost is, the social and, and uh, environmental cost, and because this will, um, uh, this is better, if, is this more efficient? While in fact it, it's not, it is not. In Egypt, for example, the, the drive to um, attract foreign direct investment was um, uh, the reason behind huge investments in cement, uh, for example. And 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 uh, and even the state was would, was subsidizing the energy for cement for cement producing uh, uh, industry, and of course, you, you know how the margins of profit is very are very 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 high in Egypt, while the uh, taxation system is is regressive uh, uh, in relation to the corporate tax uh, uh, issues, and. Uh, just after the uh, uh, revolution in, in 2011, uh, when the, um, uh, the government uh, uh, raised the, uh, the energy prices because of pressure from below uh, at these times, the, all the cement, most of the cement factories turned into importing coal to uh, as a, a, another cheaper uh, source of energy. And of course, there was a, a, a campaign in Egypt. I think Ahmed Rubi, who is in the audience now, was one uh, leading figure of that campaign against that transformation to, into using uh, coal and, and cement. But the effect is the disastrous on the environment, on the health of the, of the people, and on the the kind of, of, of structure of industry you have in the country uh, uh, really uh, integrated on the demand for uh, such products in the international market. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you for the answer. Um, um, I'm going to turn it now to Hussam Hussein to answer one question that we have, which is what is the role of NGOs in the articulation of environmental claims? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, would you please answer that? So I would add that water scarcity, land privatization, and the long legacy of, breed of neglect have exacerbated tensions in rural areas. Uh, and this is very often uh, localized in remote regions for reasons that we know. Uh, so the success of some of these protest movements in, uh, in some Arab countries was dependent on their capacity to gain support from civil society actors and to mobilize widely and to build alliances. So here, this is from where comes the question of what is the role of NGOs in articulating uh, environmental claims, I think. Uh, Hossam, uh, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, thinking of the case of Jordan, I think it really depends on which uh, kind of NGOs we look at. Some NGOs are um, closer to uh, farmers and agriculture, rural communities, some others uh, work more for uh, the claims and interests of the protection of nature. Um, but, and then like it also depends to what extent the NGOs are mainstream and aligned with uh, like with the, with the government or with the regime. Uh, and that applies, I mean, in, in the whole region, no? I mean, we have uh, royal societies uh, or, uh, or maybe some regional organizations and NGOs part maybe of international networks. So it really depends, but for instance, in Jordan, <clears throat> we have the Arab group for the protection of nature, APN, which is uh, an NGO that is very active, uh, uh, especially 
when it comes to food uh, sovereignty and uh, uh, some more from a political ecology kind of perspective, supporting in particular uh, <clears throat> small uh, farmers in uh, the Jordan Valley or other parts of the country. Uh, so they really care and fight and work on uh, ensuring the, the rural development uh, of, uh, of Jordan, of Northern Jordan and the Jordan Valley. Um, so yeah, I mean, and obviously, I mean, this case is very different uh, from the case of uh, Ecopis, Friends of the Earth Middle East, which is uh, an Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian NGO, which obviously have different kind of claims uh, and interests of working more towards uh, uh, regional cooperation, normalizing and supporting uh, uh, cooperation between these three countries. Um, and also for the rehabilitation of the lower part of the Jordan River. So I think it really depends on which kind of NGO we consider, which kind of uh, also narratives and discourses they produce and why they do so. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's my answer. But I just wanted to also add uh, one other thing about what is missing, building on what Roland was saying earlier. I think it's very important to consider the water in relation with other sectors. So like in particular water, energy and food next to something that is very uh, promoted by donors and international organizations, especially because in, case, in the case of Jordan in particular, I can see that the visions of one ministry are not really in line with the vision of the other. So it would be very useful to, uh, to, to have a common uh, vision for the sustainable development of the country, looking at the same time at water, agriculture, and I mean, you can say energy, but like there's many sectors that really need to come together because the solution that we can find for the environment is very cross-cutting and it's really to have a coherent strategy bringing together different sectors. Thank you very much, very clear. So now a question to Jessica and then one last question to Roland before we end uh, today's session. So Jessica, uh, what do you think about Abu Rish and Sower's uh, view? Because I mean, they value the role of institutional dynamics and corruption in the politics and economics of natural, natural resource management. And they reduce the blame on authoritarianism in some of the countries by so showcasing that uh, in democratic regimes, we have similar problems, even worse problems. So that is a similar impasse uh, in, in, in democratic regimes, which further stresses the role of the institutional system. Uh, I'd like to uh, know your view about this, please. Can you repeat the question, Farah? I missed the beginning yes. of it. Yes, yes. So uh, Abu Rish and Saw were value the role of institutional dynamics and corruption in the politics and economics of natural resource management. And they reduce the blame on authoritarianism by uh, showcasing that there is a similar impasse in democratic regimes on very different levels and in different countries, which further stresses the role of uh, institutional uh, systems uh, as compared to authoritarianism versus democracy. So uh, what do you have to say about this? I just ask you this because you cover the regional perspective mostly. So, uh, but you, you might not have a, uh, an answer on the top of your mind, so. <laughs> well, I'll just speak briefly because it might be that one of the other panelists, that's not actually a work that I'm familiar with. Um, yes. I think I might say briefly, I mean, I, I don't tend to frame my work within these big kind of structures like authoritarianism or democracy, and it's not sort of the kind of work I do. Um, I mean, I think there's, um, I think there's politics in any bureaucracy. I mean, wh whatever kind of uh, political system you have, I think some of those same dynamics I was talking about in terms of, um, you know, that, that, that sort of mismatch of how sort of policies play out in practice as different kind of parties are lobbying for their own interests. I mean, I think you'd find that, you find that in any country. It's certainly not an Arab region thing. Um, <laughs> or a sort of a, sub, a particular kind of regime. So um, I think that's all I have. I'll leave it for the other panelists because I'm afraid I'm not, I don't think I'm the best person to comment on that particular kind of um, yeah. theory. No, no worries, no worries at all because we have a lot of questions coming in the Q&A now. So you, uh, we're gonna ask you some other questions with which you're more comfortable with. Um, okay, but before that, let me ask this question that we have to Roland and then we go to uh, the Q&A questions again. 
Uh, uh, I'm, I'm also not familiar with uh, Abu Rish. No, and no, the... to to another question. It's another okay. question that I'm going <laughs> to ask you about. Yeah, never mind. Just forget this question. You can just forget about it. Okay. Uh, it's it's quite theoretical. I I know. So... I know. Um, and it's Yad's work, but uh, but not on this one. I don't know if it is the same never. guy or no. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think it is. I think it is, but okay. never mind. So, uh, yeah, so one question. Can you please elaborate on the notorious impacts of liberalized agricultural policy on small and medium farmers, as well as on the issues of injustice and access to land and rural neglect? I think we tapped into this a bit, but maybe if you can just... Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, with pleasure. No, no, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I and I, I maybe took it a bit historically, but if we get back to the neoliberal era, um, subsidies did not miss completely, but they did exist uh, in favor of uh, the market. So, and in favor of WTO and in favor of trade liberalization, in for, in for, in, um, like uh, also in favor of uh, water privatization. But what some, something we can see is that uh, uh, who, who will profit out of those uh, subsidies are actually uh, large landowners. I give an example in Lebanon, um, where um, yeah, the subsidies go for exporting fruit and vegetables and finding markets and um, like marketizing uh, those products. And you end up finding that there's only 70 uh, large exporters that are benefiting out of those uh, bundles distributed by uh, like uh, envelopes distributed by the government. Uh, well, same would apply in not, I would argue, the, the lack of policy enforcement, but the policy and themselves are, are often in the benefit of um, the uh, appropriation and the, the, the destruction of nature. I would give an example, for example, something that is common between um, uh, Lebanon and Tunisia, even though they are far, is that who owns the land would own also the right uh, the use of rocket right over uh, groundwater. So, and you are actually um, uh, like exonerated from having a permit uh, if you are uh, not reaching a certain level. So when, so you, it's, a, it's an open uh, way to, to allow uh, landowners and huge landowners who, who have the means actually to uh, pump in the, in the aquifer uh, to benefit out of this um, low it's a law. It's enforced, but it's a bad law. So, um, so I would I would say uh, like neoliberal um, agrarian policies um, are about dismantling uh, small farmers. It's about uh, concentrating uh, lands in uh, larger uh, plots. It's about FDIs. Also, they are uh, like uh, um, like um, marketed as being a way to to get uh, hard currencies. Um, something that also export is meant to be like bring us hard currency and I think this model is collapsing in front of our eyes in Lebanon is a very good example of this yeah. collapse we don't have any more hard currencies so uh, and uh, the world is collapsing in our on our head so but this model is actually tested everywhere um, and this is the neoliberal model that is not about uh, any more uh, you know the welfare it's not about, it's about the integration to an international model. Yes, thank you very much. So, Wael, uh, some, Munir Bouganem would like to ask you, what are the reasons for having the current distribution of governance structure for environment, water, and agricultural ministries uh, as kind of intentional? Uh, so, this is one question. One other question addressed for you, or that most probably uh, should be addressed for you, I mean, is... Uh, about carbon taxes and the removal of fuel subsidies in Arab states. While carbon taxes have a theoretical elegance, do, do you see them as having any place in Arab state context given the political sensi sensitivity of such reforms? Brief answers, please. Um, I, I, yani maybe Jessica is better uh, uh, to answer the first question because I'm not into the, the, the yani details of the structure of how the the, the policy is um, is managed, uh, but what I was saying is that it it's it's not the a matter of inefficiency that you ignore the, the these kinds of questions, uh, like she was referring to the issue of um, donors. They decide they uh, and projects they de decide their priorities, and the government doesn't put 
the environment as a priority or that kind of environment dilemmas as a priority. So they they go along with the uh, what the donors want and and benefit from it. Uh, if it get gets you more money into uh, some projects, so so get the money. And but the, the issue is not a priority in the in 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 the way it should be in the uh, public policy uh, of the government. Um, I I think that if if you you're not going to uh, shut down the uh, cement industry in Egypt, so it would be a, a very strong uh, measure to take. But for example, putting more taxes, carbon taxes on on this industry would be a good uh, idea, at least to make it, yeah, need to um, uh, make the the negative consequences less. And they have when when. When I studied the, the uh, profit margins of the industry in Egypt, just after the revolution, they have a ve very huge margins, profit margins, compared to uh, even even the, the the in the same um, uh, uh, companies uh, worldwide, uh, compared to averages in in Latin America and other countries. So. They, they, there is room for um, for taxation there, and it might benefit the uh, the fiscal space that can be used in in, in dealing with the uh, climate change uh, issues, uh, for example. But I think the these are small reforms. Uh, it, what we need now is much more radical uh, change in our way of thinking about the um, uh, dominance of the growth paradigm, econ econ GDP growth paradigm, because it, firstly, it, it doesn't see uh, what growth does to the environment. And we have to make sure that we know exactly what kind of, of policies that damage the environment, what kind of policies that can solve the social inequalities while not having uh, negative effects on the, on the, uh, on the environment. So, it is very important to change the mentality, the philosophy behind these uh, economic policy, uh, and even the way we measure economic activity. GDP is not enough, and the, now there is, uh, yeah, a huge range of, of new indices to to see, uh, uh, to better see the uh, human act, the economic activity as a human activity. Uh, interlinked with the environment, interlinked with the how people live their daily life. Yes, thank you very much, Wael, for this generous input. It actually answers some uh, two of the other questions that were asked in the Q and A. So many, many thanks. Uh, now uh, I'm going to turn it to uh, Jessica Barnes to answer one of the questions that were that were asked which is what are the strategies that are being worked on to preserve the environment and these conditions in the Middle East, especially in the Arab region? Um, yes, Jessica. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think this comes back to that question, the point I was making about how we define the environment. So if you think about the environment in these, and, and actually it's interesting to use the word preserve as well, because I think that immediately kind of connotes things like nature reserves and biodiversity conservation and that kind of, that sort of understanding of the environment and then certainly you know many countries of the region you see various kind of actions to conserve natural spaces to conserve ecosystems uh, but they as I said in my opening comments you know I don't think they have the top priority you know they don't have the highest funding sources so there are certainly those sort of strategies at work but I think um, if you think about the environment in broader terms then which I would advocate for then I mean, I think there's just sort of manifold strategies going on in all sorts of disparate fields in the region. So in the case of sort of my recent work, for example, um, if you think about wheat cultivation, agriculture as kind of an environmental issue, then, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, a lot of agricultural experts in Egypt are putting intense effort into kind of developing new varieties, thinking about that might require less water or that can cope with hotter conditions as a climate change adaptation mechanism. So there are all sorts of kind of acts, strategies that are at work. Um, but I think it really comes down to that, that question of exactly what we're thinking about when we say the environment. Yeah. Okay. And maybe thinking beyond preservation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, very clear. 
Um, I mean, we could just end the session and we could just take one more question. I'm going to ask this question and if any of you speakers uh, is comfortable answering it, please feel free to come in. So uh, that is this important question about how was the European Green Deal that will uh, impact all policies vis-a-vis -vis the MENA region perceived uh, there? whether on the state level or societal level. Um, there, 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 are also, there is a continuation for this question, but I'm going to stop, uh, stop over there. Anybody can speak about the European Green Deal and its impact on the MENA? You, you may just uh, skip it, but uh, just trying to see if somebody's comfortable answering this. Well, um, living in, um, I think, I, Hussam, where are you? In, in uh, Oxford now. So I'm the only one in the EU now, I think. So, <laughs> so uh, from an from a EU uh, resident, I would say that, well, the, uh, the European Union Green Deal, like, European in itself, European Union in itself was built on economical model. Um, the social model and e has less presence and even less the environmental one. So uh, I uh, completely adhere and understand their willingness to uh, like uh, uh, like to engage in a in a um, in a green new deal. But even the same question is in the U.S. is the way and the structure to do it. Is it through privatization? Is it through um, a private sector participation? Is it through uh, public spending and redistribution? Well, the model of redistribution, I, I like the Polanyi's pendulum. I think we are in a very uh, like critical moment, whether the pendulum is market or is social. And the same holds for any policy, whether it's environmental, social, um, and economically. So, uh, so, and this is, I think this is, uh, my reply for this one. In Actually, case. thank you. Thank you so much for replying. If nobody has anything to add, I'm gonna just mention and see if Hossam has, uh, has something to say or to react on, on it. If not, we can then just end the session and turn it over to Julia. She can be, be so so to, to just like uh, tell us more about the next panel. So, uh, Hossam, بالنسبه للمياه يوجد مفهوم المياه الوهمية وهي كمية المياه التي يتم استخدامها للإنتاج الزراعي أو الصناعي. With regard to water, there is the virtual use of water, and we try to see um, this is the quantity of water that we use for agricultural and industrial production and the comparison. It is the virtual water. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't know he doesn't speak Arabic. Sorry. He does, sorry. he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't speak. I speak Arabic, but I can't. The technical terms. He speaks are Arabic, but you need to go slow. Yes, he couldn't get the technical terms. Uh, um, I mean, building a little bit also on what uh, Renan was saying earlier, no, uh, and uh, the issue of virtual water, uh, especially for Jordan. I mean, donors and um, water scholars usually would argue that it makes no sense for one of the most water scarce countries to be exporting. Uh, virtual water in terms of uh, especially tomatoes and uh, bananas for instance but should instead try to import uh, this I mean more virtual water and uh, but like I think the question the real question that we should ask ourselves is um, who is exporting virtual water and who is benefiting from this so uh, in the case of Jordan we have large agribusinesses that are doing it really for their own uh, profit and uh, I think that's where there should be probably uh, national uh, policies and uh, uh, regulations to try to uh, not to export uh, large amounts of virtual water. <clears throat> so I think, yeah, I mean, that's a very, but obviously links back to the political economy and uh, how to implement, uh, pass the laws and implement them. So it's challenging, but I think it's an important conversation that we should have. Thank you. Yes. Julia, should we end or take one more question? It's all up to you now, Julia. Actually, sorry, Julia. And you're muted. Yeah, maybe let's, because I'm cognizant of the interpreters needing to um, end right yes. on time. Um, that's the only reason. Otherwise, we could talk about this for many hours. Um, I really want to thank all of you for being, you know, our inaugural panelist in this inaugural conference. And we hope that we will have many years ahead where we get to dig into these topics. I mean, for me, this topic and the general questions that we shared with you could have been a conference, a multi-day conference in and of themselves. So this is really like a taster. We want to, you know, 
sort of showcase the different activity areas we're working on. And this is one that we will be, you know, investing in in the, in the next few years and, and hope to really dig, dig into some of them. I just wanted to say something on the European Green Deal, um, uh, just to pitch um, that we recently did a project on this at ARI, at the Arab Reform Initiative, um, as part of a Euromesco project that we were commissioned um, to look at the European Green Deal, how it's being received from the region, um, how governments and, and activists and, and, and civil society is looking at the Green Deal in a number of countries, primarily um, the cases ended up being Morocco, Jordan, and Tunisia. And there, you know, just to link it to the, to the subject of this panel, you know, how, how important discourse is and how whenever you talk about um, these issues from a European perspective, um, uh, how quickly they're securitized. And this is something that I think, you know, uh, uh, many of you mentioned today, the idea that climate in our region um, is, uh, that climate change in our region is, is more, um, perhaps, you know, objectively can have uh, certain, you know, repercussions or, or, or that are more um, acute, but uh, how that's perceived from this side, I say this side because I'm based in Madrid, um, from this side of the Mediterranean, um, can, can be linked very quickly to questions of how do you keep people from coming here? <laughs> how do we link this to migration? And then that is constantly, you know, the struggle when you talk about these issues from a European perspective is, is how to avoid the securitization of, of climate change, which, and, 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 um, and, and the, you know, the, 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 the um, I guess, uh, ne negativism associated with some of these, uh, of some of these questions and how they might uh, affect but anyway, so so I encourage you to look up that no. report if you're interested. I mean, thank um, you, and, Julia, for coming in on this. Many thanks. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And otherwise, um, I think, yeah, it's just to thank all of you. In the next panel, um, we are turning to the question of activism. Um, so we're moving from kind of big picture, uh, top down to uh, mobilization from the ground up and uh, resistance. So not just popular mobilization, but also uh, resistance to these issues. And uh, we will have with us activists and researchers from North Africa. So the next panel will really be focused on North Africa. So I hope you stay with us. And thank you again for our panelists for joining us, for inaugurating this program with us. We hope you know we stay in touch and, and this is a long uh, relationship. Yeah, if thank I may, I also, would like, I also would like to thank all four speakers and to mention that there is a 30 minute break between this panel and the second panel, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Thank Important. you very much, yes. Julia. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. much. Bye-bye.